Uh, greetings, everyone. My name is Martin Meeker. I'm the director of the Oral History Center of the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley. And uh, today, uh, we're welcoming you to the event, Bay Area Women in Politics. Uh, this panel discussion uh, features a, a group of distinguished guests uh, moderated by uh, my colleague, Amanda Tweets. And um, this panel is a, a kickoff for a new oral history project uh, that we are about to begin called Bay Area Women in Politics. And I think Amanda will tell you a bit more about that. Um, this panel is being hosted by the Oral History Center. The Oral History Center is uh, the oral history um, organization that's part of the UC Berkeley uh, Bancroft Library. We were established in 1953. Since that time, we've conducted around 4,000 interviews. The interviews we do range uh, typically from 90 minutes to over 40 hours in length. So we estimate that we've probably done 30,000 hours of recordings over this period of time. Uh, I'm happy to let you know that um, most all of these interviews are available in transcript form for everyone to uh, read um, free of charge. Uh, and uh, you can see in the Zoom webinar chat uh, that I'm sending to all panelists, links to both our uh, online search form as well as our projects page where you can browse these oral history interviews. Uh, we have a particular strength in the history of California politics and also uh, a good strength in the history of women in politics, uh, including a, a project that was done with the surviving uh, members of the suffrage generation that I think Amanda is going to mention. Um, and uh, I'm going to uh, sign off myself and, and move to the main event, but I'd like to introduce you to Amanda Tweeds. Uh, Amanda has been with the Oral History Center now for over two years. She is a historian interviewer. Uh, she has her PhD in public history from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And uh, she works on a whole wide variety of projects, uh, uh, including history of the arts, uh, as well as politics. And she is the person who has developed this new project on the history of women in politics. So uh, let me hand it over to Amanda and uh, thank you so much. And I hope that you enjoy the event today. Thank you, Martin. And thank you especially to our panel for coming together and making this a great event today. Um, I do briefly just want to tell you about the Bay Area Women in Politics Oral History Project. As Martin mentioned, this comes on the heels of many years of our work here at the Oral History Center, um, documenting the history of women. And particularly, we have interviews with Alice Paul, Jeanette Rankin, and uh, March Fong Yu, and some really early um, interesting political leaders in California and beyond. And so moving with that, um, emphasis, we really wanted to think about this project as a way to document the history of our region's political women, from elected officials to activists to campaign staffers to fundraisers. I think we can all agree that women are often the backbone of America's political work, and we felt it was important to record that. And the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage is just next month, in case anyone has forgotten. So this is a really exciting time to be thinking about the past, present, and future of women in politics, particularly as it relates to our home in the Bay Area. But of course, we all know that uh, this is not just a historical topic. This is evergreen in the news cycle. And any day now, we're waiting on an announcement about the Democratic pres vice presidential candidate. So much more to be looking forward to here. But of course, this oral history project is going to form the basis of our conversation today. So we'll discuss what women's political work has looked like in the Bay Area since the 1970s, really. And it's gonna be an interesting way to look at the past and present. And uh, just a reminder, please stick around at the end if you can. We have a short video to show you about some of the work that we've done um, with interviews on political women in the past and a sneak peek as to what we're going to be doing in this project. Uh, because this project is going to be an expansive look at not only uh, the political women in our area, but also the activist uh, second wave feminists in particular. And there's a lot to be garnered from all of this conversation. And again, just to remind you that Martin will be monitoring the chat box. So if you have any uh, questions there, please uh, offer them up for our panelists there and we'll help um, distribute those at the end. But without further ado, let's talk to our fabulous panel here. 
Louise Rennie was a San Francisco supervisor from 1978 to 1986 and the first woman city attorney for San Francisco from 1986 to 2011. She is currently a founding partner of Rennie Public Law Group, which handles public interest matters. And she hopes to someday see a woman president, which don't we all, please? <laughs> Uh, Chanel Scales Preston is the first term member of the Pittsburgh City Council and district director for Congressman Mark Desaunier. She previously worked for Congressman George Miller and has been in public service for nearly 20 years. A lot of experience, collective experience on this panel. Libby Schaff has been the mayor of Oakland since 2015 and served on the Oakland City Council from 2011 to 2015. She was born and raised in Oakland, which she proudly describes as the most unapologetic sanctuary city in America. During her tenure as mayor, Oakland has undergone an economic revitalization and building boom, as well as cut gun violence in half. She is most proud of launching the Oakland Promise, a bold cradle to career initiative to send more low income Oakland kids to preschool and college. So we have quite the talented group of people to speak with here today. Um, I want to open this question up to all of you here at the beginning. Um, Louise, can you start off and tell us about um, your first political experience? How did you come to politics? Well, I've often wondered if the reason I uh, had an interest in law and politics is I was born on August 26th, which is the date, the day of the 19th Amendment being uh, ratified. But uh, I suppose I could say that my first political experience was actually in grade school. I went to uh, public school in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And uh, on election day, we always had mock elections. And so in grade school, we would discuss the candidates and would get to vote. And so I would have to say maybe that was my first political experience, but I think maybe the most meaningful just moving on was that uh, during the Kennedy administration, both my husband and I were uh, involved in uh, the civil rights movement and in Bobby Kennedy's campaign, which unfortunately ended so tragically. But I think that I have always had a longstanding interest in both politics and law. Um, Mayor, do you want to follow up with that? Sure. You know, I'm born and raised in Oakland, and I've always been just madly in love with my city. I know you're going to ask later about kind of our mentors, but I, I just, I can't help but bring up one right now. I, I was fortunate to have a, a godmother named Mary Morris Lawrence, and she was the first woman to be hired by the Associated Press as a news photographer in the 1930s. And my family was not political at all, but they really believed in community service and volunteerism. It was Mary Morris Lawrence who dragged me to ERA rallies, who took me to League of Women Voter meetings, who actually really encouraged me to get interested in local politics. Um, and so it, it took a while. I, I did the law school thing. I practiced law because I had huge debts for a while, but my heart was always drawn to public service. And I fell into a political staffer job kind of accidentally uh, as the aide to then city council president, Ignacio de la Fuente. Uh, after that, I got hired by Jerry Brown when he was the mayor. Uh, you know, I just stayed kind of as a staffer and then the Emerge California program really empowered me to make that step to run for office myself. I'm so grateful to them. And what about you, council member? Yes, um, I would say my first political experience was starting off as an intern for Congressman um, George Miller. Um, right after I graduated from college, it was my, um, my first gateway into just even really paying attention to politics. Um, I was really into public service and helping others. Um, and I had a professor um, that in my uh, political science classes um, that encouraged me to apply for um, an internship at George Miller's office. Um, from there, I was there for about three months and they hired me onto their team um, as a part-time staffer. Um, and I also got a chance to work for, at the time, was supervisor Mark Desaunier. 
So that made my one full-time job out of college, which I was really excited about. Um, it really helped me learn two different levels of government. <clears throat> so I got a chance to learn the county level as well as the federal level. And I had the opportunity to do that for about a year. And a job came um, open in George Miller's Washington, D.C. office. So I left and went to D.C., um, which was great for me um, because I went to Cal State East Bay, so that was really close. So it was my first real time, like away from my family, away from Pittsburgh. Um, and after two years, I came back and I stayed with George until he retired um, in 2014. And then I had the opportunity to move over with um, now Congressman Mark Desonier um, as his district director. So I have been a staffer for a long time. Um, I'm coming up on 20 years next year, believe it or not. Um, but I have had the opportunity to work on campaigns during that time as well um, for both members as well as other um, members that were running um, here in California and other states, um, helping them with their campaigns. Um, and so what made me decide to run for office here in um, Pittsburgh, um, some of the members were retiring from the city council and they approached me um, about serving on the city council. Uh, which at the time I wasn't quite sure just because um, as being a working mom, um, being on a city council, you don't get, you know, it's $500 a month. So it's just like no way to um, figure out how to do, you know, just to do one. So you still have to have a, a full-time job. Um, but once I knew that I would be able to do both through my job, um, I just jumped for a chance, anything to you know, give back and serve the community that has done so much for me. I'm so glad you um, introduced how you thought about running for office, because I think that's a big step to take for any woman. And Mayor, I was wondering if you could speak to that a bit about your decision to first run for office. And what was sure. involved in that? <laughs> um, you know, at, at it was, um, I think it all started in late 2008. Like I said, I had been a staffer. I'd been behind the scenes for a long time. I actually got laid off by the Port of Oakland. I was serving as the director of public affairs, but it was like just the whole meltdown recession. And my um, my godmother, Mary Morris Lawrence, had, had passed away. Um, and, and I kind of had a replacement godmother named Judy Johnson. And she dropped off on my front doorstep Nancy Pelosi's autobiography with the Emerge California application stuck into it with a post-it that said, you have to do this. So, um, you know, you don't say no to your, your godparents and your, your mentors. Um, and so I, I filled out the application thinking, oh, you know, I might run for office someday in the distant future. I just had my second baby, uh, you know, just changing diapers and washing bottles seemed like about the only thing I could manage. <laughs> but I got into the program and it was um, being around other inspirational women, women telling you every day, like, what have you been waiting for? You are so qualified. <laughs> that really kicked me in the, the bottom to, to actually run for office. And I, I graduated from the Emerge class of 09. I declared my candidacy in 2010. And um, I will say, like, I made that, that, that final decision um, really with just a lot of interesting prodding. Uh, studies show that women have to be asked multiple times to run. Uh, I guess men, not so much. Uh, but so just don't forget the power of actually asking, telling people that, that you see them in these roles. It makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, I I imagine though that um, uh, you had a background in law, Louise. You had a background in law, Louise. What do you think your background brought to your political career? Well, I think of course the the immediate impetus to my being appointed to the board of supervisors was due to the 1978 tragedy at San Francisco City Hall when Mayor Moscone and Harvey Milk were assassinated, and then Dianne Feinstein became the mayor. And Dianne Feinstein appointed me to take her place on the Board of Supervisors. But the background to that was that 
uh, I had been early on involved in establishing California Women Lawyers, which was a statewide organization devoted to increasing more women in the judiciary and also more opportunities for women in law and politics. And in 1977, I was the president of uh, California Women Lawyers and Jerry Brown had just appointed Rose Byrd to be Chief Justice when uh, Senator Richardson and others decided that they were going to, in effect, get her kicked off the court by not having her re reconfirmed, if you will, by the public. And so there was a campaign to oust Chief Justice Rose Byrd. Um, I, as president of California Women Lawyers and the others, we decided we needed to do something about that. And Rose Byrd was then taking the position that she would not get involved in a political campaign. So I went up to Sacramento to see one of her good friends, who's Bill Eisenberg, who then in the assembly, later mayor of Sacramento. And I said, you know, there's got to be a campaign because otherwise she will lose. And he said to me, well, Louise, you're going to run it. And I had never run a campaign before, but obviously there was no choice. So, um, you know, I ended up running the statewide campaign to retain Chief Justice Rose Byrd, and she won. And I had been somewhat involved in neighborhood politics a bit too, and with the Attorney General's Environmental Unit. Uh, and I think a combination of uh, these events, if you will, uh, led to, to Diane appointing me to take her place on the Board of Supervisors. There was a neighborhood committee and a district committee established that she looked to for recommendations and they, they recommended me. And so I then became a member of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. And I was there for a while when the city attorney died unexpectedly and Diane then appointed me to become the first woman city attorney. Well, that's a bit of the history there. I thought I didn't do that anymore. I thought I was a Zoom expert. I'm sorry. <laughs> Louise, I'm interested in that you were the first woman in that position. What did that feel like for you? What was that experience like being the first? Well, um, Obviously, I, I was very proud of being appointed by, by then Mayor Feinstein and uh, immediately became uh, immersed in the work. I, I will have to tell this funny story on myself because the, the San Francisco city attorney had been very ill. And as a result, the, the office had become in disarray, if you will, literally and physically in the conference room where everybody met or where depositions or members of the public came, there were broken chairs, there was just trash in the hallways. So the first thing I did almost the first day in the job is I told everybody they were gonna take the morning and we were just gonna clean the place up. <laughs> and I could just see some of the people rolling their eyes saying, well, that's what happens when you appoint a woman, you're gonna get house cleaning. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, I, I tell that story on myself because actually it did make a difference because I, all of the people thought, wow, you know, she really cares and, and we did. And ironically, uh, one of the things too, you know, it was early stages of IT and I called, a group in that one of that first days too and said, you know, we need a backup of all of the IT stuff that we had, such as it was in those days. And lo and behold, the morning after that, the man who was in charge died. If we wouldn't have backed it up, we would have lost all of that. So, you know, that was just kind of getting going. And then fast forward, I I guess what I'm most proud of is the affirmative litigation work that we we did 
and, and I have to give credit in this case to John Holtzman, who's now in my, one of my partners. And he came in, so, you know, I, we had this discussion about how the traditional role of a city attorney is to defend the city, defend the public officials, the mayors, the city councilmen or board of supervisors and defend the city. But there are times when you need to work affirmatively. And so I had a, a friend, some of you may know, Drew Ramey, who was then quite uh, an activist in San Francisco. And um, she was really complaining about the Olympic Club because the Olympic Club would not allow women and minorities, even though they were on San Francisco public property. They were playing on three holes of the on public property. So the first case that we did in an affirmative way was to sue the Olympic Club because they were not admitting women and minorities. And we said, you have a choice. You can either start admitting women and minorities to the Olympic Club, or you can play on 15 holes. That is your choice. And so the outcome is, as history will say, is that uh, women and minorities are now uh, admitted to the club. Women have become president. And it's very ironic that uh, some of the men who were most opposed later on actually called me to say thank you because their daughters were able to play at the Olympic Club. Thank you for there are other lawsuits that, that we did too that might be of interest. Yeah, I, I think what's really interesting about that story is that you're discussing some of the challenges that women face just being in public positions, much less uh, elected positions. But by the time, uh, council member, you came along into politics, what were some of the challenges you saw for women who had heard from uh, women who'd come before you? Yeah, so I think, you know, some of the challenges um, are you have, you know, where you're is either men or women that feel as though you're not ready. Um, or there's a, um, a way that you go about it that you need to go and talk to all these different individuals and they have to give you the blessing before you uh, run for office. Um, and And um, I think, you know, today that's, that's different. Um, I think for myself, um, you know, seeing the Women's March in 2016 and just, um, you know, being a part of um, getting involved with that movement, you just have so many women that just wanted to make a change. And living here in Contra Costa County, um, it's just something I had never seen before. I mean, to see over 5,000 women marching in Walnut Creek, um, marching and chanting Black Lives Matter, I'm like, wow, this is different. Um, and I felt represented and supported um, as well. Um, because being a staffer, you're in all these different meetings, you're around all these different groups of people, and you feel like, you know, there was just this change. And so for 2018, it was just so many women that decided to run for office. Um, and one person in particular, um, Dinah Beckham, she's our district attorney here in Contra Costa County. Um, she is the first African American um, district attorney as well as the first African American woman district attorney. Um, I enjoy working on her campaign and going out to canvas with her and just, she's just really inspiring um, just to see that Contra Costa was ready to make that change to have a woman um, in office, which helped me, you know, decide that I needed to do more just here in my community. Um, as for our city council, we haven't had many women um, on the city council. Um, I think I am number six um, as a council member. Um, but the women in Pittsburgh are really strong. Um, Nancy Parent, she happens to um, be one of our living legends here in Pittsburgh, but served on the council for a long time. Um, and she was one of the women that told me that I was running and no one tells Nancy Parent no. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, she has been one of the trailblazers um, here. Um, and I felt like the women that was before me, um, Vice Mayor Merle Kraft, who serves on the council now, 
um, she was already also very supportive. Um, and um, Yvonne Bills, she was the first African-American woman. So I think when she was elected, I was 23, just getting out of college. And I just remember going to her swearing in ceremony, just thinking how remarkable that was for her to be 29 years old um, and to be the first African-American woman to serve on our um, city council. It just um, inspires you to see that there's change and, you know, the needle is moving. And although it's moving slowly, you know, it's, it's time for women to, to do more. Mayor, I'm interested in after you graduated from Emerge in 2009 and you decide you're going to run for office of some sort someday, uh, what advice did you receive from other women about what it was going to be like or what you should be doing moving forward? Um, you know, I think some great advice for anyone who's thinking of pursuing office someday or tomorrow <laughs> is mm -hmm. it is all about like the people in your lives. Uh, so, you know, don't forget to stay in touch with your friends from high school and college. Um, get involved in things, never because you think it's going to look good on a resume or, or a campaign brochure, but because you are passionate about it. Because people who see that passion, they're the ones that are going to show up and knock on doors and call perfect strangers to tell them about your candidacy and even write you your first checks before anybody else does. So, so nurture those relationships, take care of them. Uh, get involved in things that you are uniquely passionate about, never be fake. Uh, and, and also take on some leadership roles, get appointed to a commission, get a job you know, in, in politics like a staffer. It's interesting, Chanel and I have a very similar background. Um, or join a nonprofit board, like uh, get, get in positions where you have to fundraise. It's a lot easier asking people for money for uh, you know, issues or causes you care about. It's much more uncomfortable when you're asking for yourself. So it's good practice. So, and, and then get involved with things like Emerge. Having this sisterhood, having this support network around you, it really is trying to kind of compete with the old boys network. That is a real thing. And those relationships matter. And like the Emerge stamp of approval, I know when I get a call from an Emerge alumni, I always will make time to meet with them because I know they are quality if they were in that program. So um, just those are some little pieces of advice um, you know, career paths are funny. They're not, I'm, I never dreamed of being in elective office, like even getting out of college as a poli sci major, it just didn't seem like a thing that I would ever think about doing. So your, your career is funny. Um, trust your values and your gut, uh, and it will, it will take you in the right direction. Louise, I'm hearing the mayor talk about uh, the importance of networks. And I know that when you were first running for office, there was no such thing as a merge. How did you build those networks with women or people who would support a woman running for office? Well, I, I think Mayor Schaaf's uh, advice is very good and, and advice I tried to follow as well. I, I try to let you know my friends, my neighbors know uh, that uh, I welcome their support. Uh, back in those days, I mean, you you used to campaign on the corner buses, uh, Muni system, uh, also the bingo games. Those those were a big thing in those days. You know, you went around on on the bingo circuit. You you hassle pass your literature out, they'd give you a little time while the bingo is being called. And so, you know, the, the, the traditional ways. I think another thing too is it's particular if you are already holding office, if, if I never allowed any deputy city attorney to get involved in the campaign in any way, but I always certainly hoped that they were enough supportive of me that they would be telling their friends, hey, you know, she should be re-elected. Re, re um, I'll also just say uh, back to the, your question about the early days when I became city attorney and I, I, I pass this on to anybody who gets in a, a position where you have the ability uh, to make a difference. I think it is very critical 
uh, as the people you appoint and to make sure that whatever office you hold is as diverse as possible. Uh, when I first became city attorney, of course, I was the first woman city attorney, but there were no women in charge of very important areas uh, of the office. So uh, I appointed the first woman to head the litigation uh, part of the office, which is huge. I appointed a Latina woman to be the general counsel at the San Francisco airport, which had never been done before. And so I think that a message I would give to people is, as Mayor Schaaf says, you know, you have to be nice to people. <laughs> you have to be thoughtful and considerate so that they have a reason to support you and then do the substantive work that adds to more reasons uh, to support you. And so I think Mayor Schaaf's advice and others' advice about that is, is very well taken. Oh, I should add too, just as a little historical aside, that Kamala Harris, now Senator Harris, uh, in the early days headed our family and children's services team, and she did an excellent job. <laughs> Very good. Um, so Louise, when you attained this position of power, you were able to help bring up women behind you. And I'm wondering, um, council member, if you can speak about how you think about mentoring other women or, or how that will come for you in the future. Yes, so um, I think over the past couple of years, I have really focused on um, the young women in our community. Um, as well as even in the office, make, ensuring that we have women on our team, um, making sure our team is diverse, um, as well as interns. Um, just here in the community, there are different groups that have been working with um, young people who are interested in running for office or on the planning commission or in any other type of commission. Um, and I have been making sure, I've been making myself available um, to speak with them, to mentor them. Um, there are two that are getting ready to run for office now um, for school board here within the city of uh, Pittsburgh. Um, and just letting them know, um, similar to what Mayor Schaaf mentioned is, you know, you just gotta be true to yourself. Um, I think people see authentic, if you're authentic or not. Um, the tough part now is just during COVID and you can't be like face to face. Um, here in Pittsburgh, knocking on doors is what really works um, here still. Um, and it's not social media. And I learned that from my campaign. Um, people appreciate you coming to their door and just having a conversation and wanting to know where you stand on the issues. And just wanting to see that passion behind if you're going to fight for those particular issues that they really truly care about. Um, and just to see a face with a name. Um, so, you know, just as these young women are getting ready to run, um, you know, my goal been just trying to introduce them to as many people in the community as possible, um, because those people will encourage others. And if that's one vote, you know, the next person to help push for the next vote, um, whether they're just putting signs on your, in your neighborhood block on everyone's door, um, you know, any little help, any little help from a constituent um, actually works. So um, my goal been just to work with all of our women here within the community to get them up and ready. Mayor, same question. I'd really be interested to hear how you think about mentoring other women. Well, let me just start by appreciating all the mentors I've had. Um, you know, I remember when I was running for mayor, like there was never a poll that showed me winning. And like maybe three weeks before, like anyway, it was very close to election day. It was like a critical time. Uh, absentee ballots had just been dropped. And I got a call, Barbara Boxer, who was, was still our senator, our US senator at that time, who never endorsed in local races called me and she said, I want to endorse you. And she actually flew out to Oakland to do it in person with a big press conference. And when she was done, she, she talked about how our paths 
to these offices were so similar, how we started in the background, how we worked behind the scenes as staffers, how we raised kids and juggled that while trying to keep our, our true to our passions for public service. And when she was done, she handed me her speech and it was handwritten in her own handwriting on just yellow lined paper. <laughs> And she said, I want you to have this and to keep it because I wrote every word myself, like from my heart. Hmm. And, and I, I won the election actually with, with a very strong margin, uh, considering that no poll had ever showed me, me winning. And I, I believe her endorsement was, was one of those turning points, um, not to mention Jerry Brown's endorsement, which, which was also very helpful, but I had worked for him. Like it was, it was different. And so when other women just reach out, I mean, my, my house was vandalized last week. Who mm -hmm. calls me personally to see how I'm doing? But Kamala Harris and Dianne Feinstein. Mm -hmm. So that mentoring, even when you get into position, like it's never, no one is ever above being mentored. Even when you're the mayor of a major American city, mm -hmm. I appreciated those calls so much. Now, as I try and mentor others, I do it a lot through the Emerge program. Um, you know, that way I feel like I can hit a lot of people all at once. Um, I come every year and I do the fundraising training because women, that you need to learn to love fundraising. It's really empowering once you get into it. And, you know, I try and put my money where my mouth is. I try and write checks to women who are running. Um, it was cool. I saw a little comment from Catherine Stephanie, who was in my class in Emerge in 2009, who was appointed and then ran uh, to be San Francisco supervisor. Someone, again, who was a staffer for years. Um, I want to uh, shout out Lupe Valdez. Chanel and I were talking about her when I got my first job in politics and I knew nothing. Like I, I you know, had this fancy law degree and I had worked at a big law firm. So I thought I was gonna work on policy, but in, in Ignacio, and I think this is a great policy, everyone has to do constituent work. No matter how fancy your degree is, you have to answer the phones and solve whatever problem is on the other line. And every call that came in, I would say, that is a very interesting issue. I am so sorry that is happening to you. I will get right back to you with a solution. And I'd hang up the phone and I'd say, Lupe, how do I, what do I do? <laughs> She was so patient with me. So whether it's at the workplace or through programs like Emerge, we have to pay it back because so many women, and Louise, you're one of my just sheroes, so many women have blazed the trail, have punched through those glass ceilings for us, and we've got to, to do the same. So whether it's, again, just looking people in the eye and telling them, you are amazing, you have to run, do not T let anyone tell you that it's not your turn because it's your turn now. Like just, just even that cheerleading, aside from writing the check and actually showing up and phone banking and knocking on doors and doing just the shoe level, the shoe leather stuff of, of campaigns. That is how you pay it forward. And we all have to do that. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, Louise, do you have anyone to add as a mentor or someone you could look up to when you first started in politics? Well, obviously, um, Diane Feinstein was the one who appointed me to take her place on the Board of Supervisors, and she had big shoes to fill. And um, I thoroughly enjoyed my time on the on the Board of Supervisors, even though it was a very, very turbulent time in the aftermath of what had happened uh, in, in the assassinations. And of course, no, no sooner uh, did we have that when we had Proposition 13 and we had the whole AIDS epidemic uh, to contend with. And throughout it, you know, um, I'm happy to say I was able to work very closely with with then Mayor Diane Feinstein, but I I have been very lucky all my life. Uh, and first of all, I had a mother that I know people don't usually say their mothers were a mentor, but I would have to say mine was. I mean, my mother uh, was never able uh, to to go to college. Economic circumstances wouldn't permit, but 
but she was always, even when I was a little kid, Louise, you have to do well in school. Both my parents, you have to do well in school. There was no differentiation between my brother or me. We both had to do well. We both had to, to do well. When I was in college, I had a mentor uh, that took a special interest in helping me uh, know that I could go to law school, even though some of the law schools in those days still were not admitting women or had just admitted women, and, and which is hard to believe. I mean, like Harvard Business School, for example, didn't admit women. And, uh, but I had a mentor in college who kept saying, you know, you can do it, you can do it. And so um, I, I have felt very fortunate to have mentors all I, I don't know anybody who can honestly say there hasn't been somebody in their life that helped them along. And I try to pay back uh, by working with um, young people in public housing here in San Francisco. Uh, there's, a, there's a wonderful organization called Friends of the Children that mentors uh, children from basically first grade all the way through high school and though i'm not part of the organization now i'm a, a retiree i still can continue to work with some of the families that i became close to because i think as as everybody on this program knows you you have to if you're fortunate you have to give back it's it's what makes a better world and certainly in this day and age where the needs are so great, I think we have to take particular time out to think, how do we go about reaching out and helping others who are in need right now? And hopefully they in turn will turn around and give back. I think that's a really hopeful note. Uh, I want to give you a final question to have all of you think about what do you see as the future of Bay Area women in politics? What are you hoping for? What is, what's coming our way? Gosh, council member, why don't you start us off? Oh no, it looks like we're, we can't hear you right now. No. <laughs> How about, how about yeah, now? Success. Okay. Um, I see more women, um, more women in um, politics um, at every level of government, um, but also just um, more women in the workplace. Um, that's something that we do not see. Um, even as a staffer, um, some meetings I go to, sometimes I'm still the only woman in the room, um, admit it or not, sometimes I'm still the only African American person in the room as well. Um, but just to see um, more diversity um, within businesses um, and having women of color um, that are in management roles and positions, I think that's a big change that we're going to see coming. And I look forward to that. Um, and I think as, as we start to see more women, we'll start seeing more positive change. Um, you know, California is just one of those states that's always at the forefront um, and leads the way um, for the rest of the states um, a lot of the time. So, but we'll start seeing that slowly move across the other way um, as we continue down this path or just making sure, um, you know, gender equality is, is met. Uh, for all of us. Louise, how about you? What do you see for the future? Well, I think uh, more women in politics, uh, most definitely, I hope. Uh, I'd like to pick up on the point, though, that the councilwoman has, has brought, and that is diversity and inclusion in the workplace. It's absolutely critical. Um, for reasons I won't get into today, I am involved in some litigation that has to do with the lack of diversity in the corporate governance structure. If you do a search of virtually every American corporation today, you will find a number that A, never have, still not have, 
and had no immediate plans to have a black American on the board, uh, no Latino on the board, no other diversity. Women are starting to make mark white women. But if you take a look at the lack of diversity in the corporate boardroom, where you know there are things a person on a corporate board can do just like an elected official for example you can make sure that your suppliers are diverse it's it, you can make sure your law firms are diverse etc so i think that just as there has been and will continue to be uh, a major effort required in the political realm that in the economic realm there is so much work to be done and hopefully i think with renewed vigor and in interest out growing out of tragedy that hopefully we will be able to take the tragedy of george floyd's death and the movement that seems to be making a difference will hopefully continue and spread out not only through the political world but the economic and certainly corporate world. That's my hope. That's wonderful. Mayor, uh, last word on this. What do you see as the future of Bay Area women in politics? Well, let me talk about the future I want to see. Um, and I think all of us will say we have to be optimists to survive in these careers. It's what gets you out of bed in the morning because we also have to hold tremendous suffering and tragedy in our communities. Uh, that is also part of our jobs. But I wanna see a world that is equitable and where everyone thrives. And when I talk about equity, I believe that structural racism is one of the biggest uh, barriers to everything good that we want for the world. And that includes uh, getting a, an actual representative democracy. It's not just about women, but it's also about people of color. It's about anyone who does not fit the dominant, you know, identity. Um, and, and we have to start to reverse engineer those policies, those practices that have been in place forever that are maintaining these obstacles to keep people getting these opportunities. So I just think we have to name that and, and rededicate ourselves to breaking them down because everyone suffers when we have taken huge swaths of our community and deprived everyone of the talent, of the brilliance of the people that are living in our, our cities. And I, again, as a mayor, I, I think a lot about cities. The other part about everyone thriving, it is so unacceptable that so many people do not have their basic human needs met. Yeah. The, the expense of housing, the fact that people are having to hold down three jobs just to pay rent or to feed their families is atrocious. And that also deprives us of representative political leadership because most political positions have to be done in your free time, right? They don't pay a full-time salary. And so you, and even if, if you are running for an office that does pay a salary, a full-time salary, you, you have to be a candidate on your own time. And so many people cannot reasonably do that, uh, as well as addressing the gender roles that make women both feel, but also in reality take on all the responsibilities of the household. The other advice that I give women is find a great partner in life. My husband does all the laundry. I am so proud of that. I am so grateful for that. You know, like you've got to find partners that are willing to be actual equal partners in raising kids, in holding down a household. Uh, you know, the, the biggest barrier I have found is all the mom shaming that goes on when you run for office if you have young children. So uh, that's both a psychological warfare, but it's also a reality. So I just see a future where we have resolved these inequalities as well as the injustice of poverty. And that is what our democracy needs to really invite everybody to that table. Thank you. I think that's a good note to end our larger conversation on. Uh, Martin, uh, can you share with us some of the questions that have been coming from the audience? 
Well, uh, I certainly invite our attendees to uh, submit some questions through the Q&A panel. A few have come through largely uh, kind of uh, questions for the mayor about uh, urban, urban politics. There was one on potholes, uh, but of course. <laughs> um, but if there are any more specific questions, please either use the chat or the Q&A. Um, but actually, I have a one question, and, and uh, in particular, the mayor. Um, you've mentioned this uh, program, Emerge California, and I'm sure that everyone can look it up uh, through Google, uh, but I'm wondering if you can tell me a little bit about it and, um, and, and what, it, what, it's, what it's done and what it does for people. Sure, Emerge California was founded by uh, Andrea Dusteel and Susie Tompkins Buell with this idea that we needed to create a pipeline of democratic women things like Emily's List and other programs would support women who were running for a state, a state office or a federal office. But so often before you're ready to do that, you've you know, served on your library commission. Isn't that, I think, how Nancy Pelosi got her start, if I'm not mistaken. Or you know, you, you've run for city council or school board. Like you've got to start somewhere. And so Emerge was intentional about helping women run for their first office. And um, it has been so successful. It now has three programs in California, so Northern, Central, and Southern. And then they also spun off Emerge America that has started Emerge programs in states all across the country. Um, and you know, they've had some huge successes. I think in Virginia, of, of, you know, the, the number of seats that flipped from Republican to Democrat the vast majority of them were won by Emerge graduates. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just, on a personal level, again, the sisterhood, the friendships uh, that I've made, the people who not only help with my campaign, but when I'm having a policy problem, I can pick up the phone and call. Um, this, this network has just been a gift that keeps on giving. Uh, there are probably other programs out there, and I don't want to assume everyone is um, a Democrat, I'm sure the Republicans have a similar uh, program, but this idea of, of starting the pipeline, I think was brilliant. Uh, and, and it's very practical training. They train you, I mean, the communications training is life-changing. And this is something that I think Emerge recognizes is that women tend to be more authentic communicators. And instead of trying to train us out of that, they actually try and help us polish that natural inclination. And I think people are ready for a little more authenticity and just being real from their politicians, right? So um, I just, I'm so thankful Emerge trains you on field strategy, how to pick a campaign consultant, like I said, fundraising. Uh, so all these practical aspects of actually being the candidate. And I think like many Emerge graduates, I had worked on other people's campaigns. I had, you know, worked behind the scenes for politicians. It's not the same when you are the candidate. And to get that intense training, as well as the gift of this network, uh, it is invaluable. I always say if it weren't for Emerge, I would not have run and I wouldn't have won. So just big love out to my Emerge sisters. I saw Catherine Stephanie out there um, and just, and, and if you're not ready to do it, write them a check, write them a check. They need to raise money to run. And um, right now we need good leadership in this country. I think uh, we've got to keep people in love with democracy, and it is being threatened in a way that I have never seen in my lifetime. So uh, please support programs like Emerge. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. That was a, an excellent uh, description of it. We have a question uh, from a gentleman named Zach who asks, what are the two, uh, two or three best things we, meaning men and women, can do to recruit and support young women to run for and win elected office. Councilmember, do you want to take that one? Yeah, yes, um, I would say first uh, would be uh, once you find the candidate that's that's running, um, you know, money. Um, I would say. Um, you know, the male candidates that I were running against, um, they were receiving more money um, than the female candidates. 
Um, there were six people that were running in my race, um, two women and four men. And when you go back to look at um, the fouling records, um, you know, some of those even happen to be different organizations or unions or people, for some reason, you know, they supported male candidates more. More money went behind the male candidates. So even though, um, you know, they supported me, the dollar amount was low. Um, so I would say, you know, be fair and equal um, to support women as well. Um, and um, second, you know, whatever support you can provide um, in mentoring and guidance or important that, um, you know, showing that person or introducing that person to an individual who may be able to help. Um, you know, I was blessed that I worked for Congressman George Miller and um, Congressman Mark Desanye. And so everyone don't have those types of opportunities. Um, and I didn't know that I was actually being mentored by these males, right? But I was, um, and they were great. Um, you know, I grew up in a neighborhood that um, I didn't come from a lot. And so I appreciate all the opportunities that um, came before me. Um, but the um, structure that I, um, my work environment, my um, colleagues are like my family. So it's like my George Miller family. Some of those people then broke off. Um, Melanie Weintraub happens to be a campaign consultant and came out of retirement to help me with my campaign, but she used to work for George Miller. Um, Latrice Alford, another person who used to work for George Miller, but came out to help me with my campaign. Um, and so my Desonier team, like you, we mentioned Lupe a bit earlier, and um, my former chief of staff helped me with my candidate statement. Um, you know, the people around you um, can be really supportive and can be your family as well. And so I'm just blessed to have just that large family um, of my colleagues um, to help with that push. And so I think, you know, we can look outside our box um, with other individuals to help us get to the goal. Thank you, council member, appreciate that. I, I uh, look at the clock and I see it's 1 p.m. and we need to be respectful of our, our busy panelists uh, schedules. So I'm gonna hand it back to Amanda for any closing remarks. And I do wanna uh, encourage you to stay on uh, as kind of a, a, post, uh, a post event event and uh, Amanda will describe a, a video that she's gonna show. Yes. Well, thank you again, all of you for joining us. I think um, the stories that you've shared today really reflect the kind that we want to document in the, the Oral History Project, Bay Area Women in Politics, because it is so important to hear about the behind the scenes machinations of um, how you get the political work done and who supports you along the way. And I think you've offered us many wonderful examples of that. So thank you to all of you. Mayor Libby Schaff, Council Member Chanel Skills Preston, and former Supervisor Louise Rennie. Uh, if you want to stick along with us and watch our video, you may. I, I know you've got busy lives. Um, okay, so for those of you sticking around, uh, we're going to show you a snippet of a video that I had a wonderful intern last summer, Eleanor Naiman, who created this piece, dig into our archival collection and uh, looking at older oral histories, you'll see some familiar names in there like Alice Paul, and also thinking about how we could connect this archival oral history work we already have with the future of this oral history project. So you'll see a little bit of that there, and if all goes well, I will share my screen and this will be easy. Actually, one second, oh. um, Amanda, before you go ahead, I just uh, wanna uh, again uh, thank uh, our panelists uh, from the Oral History Center, or to our panelists from the Oral History Center. We appreciate your time and, and uh, you're welcome to stick around and watch this, but certainly uh, if you need to go back to work, we understand that as well. Uh, for all of those uh, still staying with us, uh, there's still a, a bunch of attendees. Um, as director of the Oral History Center, I uh, want to certainly um, invite you to support the work of our center as well as uh, this project. Um, the Oral History Center is a basically a nonprofit at the University of California. We are a soft money operation, so all the interviews that we do need to be funded externally. Uh, so if you want to support this project and others, 
I encourage you to uh, go to um, this link right here about our funding and, uh, and donate a tax deductible donation to the Oral History Center. So um, with that said, I'm gonna hand it back over to uh, Amanda. Thank you so much. Thank you, Martin. Here we go. Is there any way, um, Alice, that, that you could characterize the, uh, the women in this movement? Is, is there any, any trait or, or characteristic always, that any of them had in common? I always thought there was one thing that they all had in common, which I presume you have. I don't know, <laughs> I think you have, um, which was a, a feeling of loyalty to her own sex and a, a, an enthusiasm to have every degradation that was put upon her sex removed. That's what I had anyway. There's a slogan in the legislature. You want to keep a woman in calm. Is that right? And they said, no, that was in 16. Oh, that was right. And the woman had <clears throat> just gotten along. Oh, I didn't know that. that <clears throat> my, that is a... Uh... They knew I could stay. Uh huh. So the people would vote for me. I see. Because I had a better organization than any man mm -hmm. and than any woman has had since. This town was really stunned and when I won and it it like the headline in the it was the mirror in those days said, It's a girl. And I mean, it was a full headline, and the story went across the country. And of course, I, uh, I wore twenty. Time. <laughs> I wore twenty. I bought twenty pairs of shoes out, and mm -hmm. it became a real. I was the first woman in a to be elected in a major city in the United mm -hmm. States, mm -hmm. and um, a city of its size. Yes. You know, I mean, it had been on little right. cities, but nobody in a major city. Mm -hmm. and, Even though I. I, you know, went in there green. I really learned, and I was not going to be caught. And I knew the rules of the council, and I knew that charter inside and out by the time I sat down in that seat. And thank God I did, because I was resented when I first got there greatly. I mean, most of the men were old enough to be my father, my grandfather. And, you know, They've here is, oh, yeah. And I mean, it was really murder when I arrived. And uh, it was not pleasant at the mm -hmm. beginning at all. I think at the beginning they kind of thought it was a novelty in terms of, well, nobody with a Chinese American has ever even attempted to do anything like this. Uh, she's just kind of a foolhardy person trying something to be impossible. So, and I guess when they found out that, well, indeed I did it, I was successful and the period that I'm going to keep on doing it mm -hmm. and keep on staying there, I think they began to really then uh, begin to um, except me for what I was doing. He was a curious man. Mm -hmm. But he really didn't think that much. I think. Place. And there were many men that I encountered who didn't. Mm -hmm. But naturally, when you find somebody like that, you, you, you get around and know that mm -hmm. you don't try to get your mm -hmm. head on the mm -hmm. collision with and explain to them why. Mm -hmm. Remember, mm -hmm. the why. Political, my method was to try to, not necessarily to be the person who had the bright idea. Mm -hmm. If you could plant it in somebody else's hand, mm -hmm. so much better. It was their idea, mm -hmm. and you could help them, which I, a role I liked. Mm -hmm. But I really never have felt that by yourself you get anywhere politically mm -hmm. anyway. You're either too far out in front, mm -hmm. so there no, there's nobody behind you. Uh, or you're just a lonely voice mm -hmm. in the wilderness. I see. I think that ha you have to move with a certain consensus mm -hmm. in order to make any progress. No, I get the feeling of uh, we're the drones. We're the I ones see. that uh, mm -hmm. literally put the campaigns on. And uh, they need us. I see. I we're, we're the workers. We're the ones that really do the... the, the uh, day in and day out, manning of headquarters, volunteers, etc., and put on the campaign. With the teachers and those in Tuskegee mm -hmm. and Howard, they instilled in we older ones that we were not 
we would not get what we thought we would get. We would not get any positions that we were entitled, but we must struggle and work to place the other younger ones behind in those positions. And it would take time, so we'd have to have the patience. I see. Now, and would, I have lived to see yeah. the things that I work for come to pass today, because I never thought I'd see so many young black women in positions that I see them in today. We needed clubs and organizations to, to get these women into so they could <laughs> learn the mechanism mm -hmm. of, of running the country and their part in it because we all felt that someday that women would step in mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and take over some of these offices mm -hmm, themselves. More and more, uh, reporters have learned too, that if you ask a woman about her children, you ask the man. Uh, that they, reporters, especially female reporters, have come to understand that these small things, relatively small questions, when taken together, can uh, the, the age, the color of the dress, the where are your children, can unfairly put a woman candidate in a box that is a disadvantage. And so over this same generation, that's changed a lot. You know, there's a difference between winning the election and changing the culture. So uh, my job was always to win the election. What I knew in the off season was that I could study what things were happening in the culture that were making it harder for these women to win and then work on solutions that I could try out in ways that would give them advantage, that would enable them to dispel um, notions or prejudices about the way gender might be holding them back or hobbling them some way. And so that was great fun, but I was never confused that a campaign that I was working in was, was that, the, that anything about that campaign what should be designed to change the culture. It should be designed to win the election. All right. That video is also available on YouTube for those of you who want to take a gander. Um, and thank you again to everybody for coming with us on this journey today. And again, to all our panelists for engaging in such a wonderful conversation. I really appreciate it and look forward to many more. Thank you.